So Jared, I was I was hoping we could start with your origin and kind of just set the stage with that. Um, you know, where you're from, what you were into as a kid, those kinds of things. Sure. So I was born and raised in Owensboro, Kentucky. Um, it's in the western part of the state, about an hour and 15 minutes west of Louisville, Kentucky. Um, grew up here my entire life and really was um, just kind of involved in everything that was going on. I was one of those kids that uh, played every sport growing up that I could get into. Uh, you know, we were involved in, in all the youth activities in town. We were um, involved in community plays and, and theater and things like that. So really, um, I was just that kind of kid that was interested in and every little thing that was happening in town and um, wanted to, to be involved with, with everything that was going on. And so, um, you know, grew up here, got into high school um, and played football and did track and field. Um, and so really just enjoyed that um, and, and went to one of the larger high schools um, in the state of Kentucky, certainly the largest um, in our area. Um, and really enjoyed that, and um, it, it has led to some some pretty cool things. Now I'm back here in town, um, working for a, a school district that's not the one that I graduated from, which is uh, pretty interesting. But um, you know, we've come a long way since since I was a little kid growing up here. That's awesome. Uh, what high school did you go to, if you don't mind me asking? Sure, I graduated from Davis County High School, um, so it's one of our two county high schools. Um, here in the Davis County Public Schools District, and then now I work for um, Owensboro Public Schools, which mm -hmm. has Owensboro High School um, as, as its main high school. Cool. Yeah, I know more. I know more about um, the geography of Kentucky than I ever thought I would. Just as a result of going to Hanover with you and and most of my friends, a lot of my friends and teammates were were from Kentucky. So it's a beautiful, beautiful state. Uh, yeah. Speaking of that, what what's Jared doing outside of work? You know, what are you if you're not informing the public, uh, what are your hobbies? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's still kind of that same deal from when I was a kid. I, I'm involved in a lot of things. Um, I'm involved in the uh, Chamber Young Professionals, which is our young professionals group here in Owensboro. Um, looking to be involved in leadership in that in the coming years. So that's exciting. Um, you know, we've really grown that group to, to really be involved in the community and um, doing volunteer things, having different events, especially for people who are new to the community. Um, Owensboro has always been kind of a place uh, that, you know, once you're here, you, you grow up and you stay here for a long time. But we've really come into a place where people are starting to look at Owensboro as a destination where they want to live and where they want to um, kind of start to build their family. So it's fun getting um, some new people that are, you know, kind of in their mid thirties. Um, they're looking for a new place to relocate, to come to our community. So that's a lot of fun. Um, you know, outside of that, um, you know, I, I uh, do a lot of hunting and fishing um, in my spare time. Western Kentucky is, is great for that. Um, and Owensboro is a, a fun, unique community in that you can literally be out in the country in about 50, 15, 20 minutes um, and have a lot of place to uh, spread out and get outdoors and, and have a lot of fun. So, but we're close enough to, um, you know, several major cities. I mentioned being an hour and 15 from Louisville, two hours from Nashville, three hours from St. Louis. Um, so, you know, you can get out and get that big city feel when you want to. Um, but you also have the opportunity to kind of get out and just do some fun stuff um, around town. Uh, I'm getting married in January, so we've got, got a lot of wedding planning taking up a lot of my time outside of work right now, uh, but really looking forward to that. My fiance Liz, is, is from Louisville. She also lives here um, in Owensboro now, so uh, we're excited to, to have her here. Um, but yeah, staying very busy outside of work, uh, but a lot of it is work-related, so. Sure. Yeah, I know, I know uh, the wedding planning can be busy, not, at, not from personal experience, but from watching my now wife uh, take the lead on most of that. It's uh, it, it's quite the quite the experience, I would say. So congratulations, by the way. Thank you. That's kind of where I'm at. I'm letting her handle most of it, but here and there, I'll uh, step in and and make a decision if she's between two things and, and kind of help her out with that. But I just told her I don't want to see a bill. Just don't show me a bill. <laughs> yeah, that's probably pretty smart. <laughs> uh, so can we talk about your current role, Jared? You're the public information officer 
for the school district there. Um, you know, how many students and staff do you serve, I guess, first of all? And then can you just kind of talk about what you do on a day-to-day, week-to-week? Sure. So Owensboro Public Schools is the largest independent school district uh, in the state of Kentucky. So we serve about 6,000 students um, in our community, and we are about 76% of our student population um, qualifies for free and reduced lunch. So we have um, a majority minority um, student population in our district. Um, we have a large amount of, of poverty um, in our district. So, um, you know, we, we have a, a lot of challenges, but um, things have been going really well. Our district has continued to grow um, over the past 10, 15 years. Um, we're still seeing that even through um, COVID, you know, over the past year, which was difficult in and of itself. That, that we could do a whole hour on that in and of itself. Um, but yeah, we have about 6,000 students in our, in our district. Um, we have 12 schools, two high schools, two middle schools, um, and five elementary schools. Um, sorry, we have three high schools. Um, one is an alternative high school, um, and then two preschools as well. So um, we're, we're a really good sized school district that's really focused on um, neighborhood schools. Um, so each little neighborhood in our community has their own elementary school, and um, you know we're, we're moving in the right direction. So this public information officer role is something that I knew nothing about four years ago. Um, didn't know it existed, didn't know it was a thing. Um, and, and we'll kind of get into to where I was at the time, but um, you know, this is a position I've come to learn that's relatively new. Um, you know, I, I think they first started to kind of become a position um, when you started seeing more and more crisis situations in schools, whether it be um, active shooter situations, which, you know, is obviously everyone's worst case scenario um, in this position. But there's a lot of things that um, that we deal with outside of uh, crisis communication. It is a, a portion of it, um, but it's somebody that, you know, knows how to handle the media, um, knows how to strategically communicate um, both with the media and with the public. Um, and so it's a position that's really developed over the past several years. I'm actually the third person um, to have this role um, in our school district um, and only the second that has had the role specifically as just the public information officer. The first uh, woman who had this position several years ago uh, did something else in the district and just kind of got assigned to handle, um, you know, photos and videos and things when social media first started to, to kind of become a thing. So um, it's really grown and developed. Um, and so now in the position that it is now, I'm responsible, yes, for um, sharing the, the information to the public, but I, I actually kind of hate the title because uh, we do so much more than just spew out information um, on a daily basis. Of course, uh, the primary role is what I always tell people is just handling the public relations um, for the school district, whether that be uh, photos, videos, social media, um, handling media uh, questions and, oppor and opportunities um, to get our district on camera. Um, I, I primarily focus much of my time on earned media, um, meaning that we get coverage in local media, newspapers, television, um, those types of things without having to pay for that coverage. Um, saves our district and taxpayers a lot of money um, in the long run. And can I, can I, are we, can we edit this? Like, or yeah, we running live. Okay. Give me one second. I'm going to tell them to stop doing that drilling. Cause I'm sure you can hear that. Can you hear it? A little bit. Yeah. Okay. I'll no tell worries. You. So really, um, you know, one of the things that I try to focus primarily on is earned media um, for our district. And really, uh, for those that don't know what that is, it, it means getting coverage um, in our local news media, whether it be newspaper, television, um, an online blog type of news outlet, um, completely for free. So it's really just about getting on there um, and having that coverage for our district, most of which is overwhelmingly positive. We're, we're very grateful in that regard, uh, but it saves our district a ton of money, saves our taxpayers a ton of money. Um, and, and it's really just a way to help let the community know the good things that are happening in our schools. Um, I often tell people um, that 
public information officers uh, refer to ourselves as more storytellers um, than just people who spew out information. Um, it's been something that you've had to learn to uh, record and edit video, um, sometimes do audio because you'll have a, a radio station, a NPR or somebody local wants to call and do an interview um, and you have to record yourself and edit it out and make sure that it sounds good. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into it more than just making a post on Facebook or something like that. I'm responsible for writing press releases um, that include photographs and videos and those types of things for staff announcements or big things that happen um, in the district. I mean, I was just telling you just today, um, you know, we are less than a month away from the start of our school year. We start on August 11th and we uh, had to get out our reopening plan because everybody wanted to know what was going to happen um, with COVID, what restrictions were going to still be in place, what was going to change. Um, and so I had to tell you, hey, we gotta, we gotta postpone for a couple hours because I'm in the middle of doing TV interviews. And that's, that's the funny thing about this job is you can have a calendar all you want, but it's gonna get interrupted um, a lot. Um, so, yeah. you know, it's a lot of fun. You do something new every day um, and each person's role um, um, in the public information officer, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, people have to do different things for different districts. So in addition to all of the public relations and media relations and things that I do uh, for our district, I also um, work alongside the school safety um, group uh, here in our district. Um, I'm responsible for communicating with the police department in the event that we have um, a crisis, which we've we've had several. Nothing that ha has risen to you know worst case scenario um, type of deal, but there are times where something may happen um, on a Friday night in our community, and they need to and a student is involved, you know, and they need to get in touch with the family or or those types of things or um, you know vandalism and they have a kid on camera and they need to know who it is, you know, thing, things of that nature, um, you know, interacting with the police department on that. Um, we're also really fortunate to um, have a great relationship with our police department and they have a, um, an app that they have for their police force that they actually gave to our um, school safety team to be a part of. And it includes, um, we get notifications for anything like a shooting or stabbing in the community, um, a firearm discharge, a man with a weapon, man or woman with a weapon, um, gas leak, structure fire, a number of different things that could potentially impact a school. And so when those alerts come through, we're able to instantly pull it up on a map on your phone and say, oh, there was a shooting at apartment complex right across the street from one of our schools we should probably put the school on lockdown um, for the time being. And mm -hmm. so we've had that happen uh, being in an urban setting. We've had it happen where, you know, a man and a woman get in a fight at their apartment and one of them shoots at another and uh, it comes up and we have to put the school on lockdown. And so, um, you know, it's, we've actually ended up calling it either a lockout or um, police protocol um, because when people hear lockdown, they think, oh my gosh, someone's in the building. Um, you know, this is, this is horrible. Um, and that's not always the case. You know, we're able to take steps now to protect people um, within seconds of, of getting an alert that something's going on. And so being a part of the school safety team um, is an important part of, of what I get to do. Um, and then at the same time, you know, I, I'm also um, responsible for building relationships in the community with community partners. Um, that could be everything from uh, generating, you know, sponsorship dollars for different things and events that we as a district want to do um, to, you know, getting other community partners involved in our schools, whether it be, um, you know, employees from a bank wanting to come read to students or um, a state farm agent wanting to do a monthly award where they recognize a student um, for, their academic achievements, perfect attendance, or whatever it may be. Um, and so that's a fun part of the job too, getting to, to really interact with the community and make sure that they feel involved in our school district as well, and not just sending their kids off to school every day. Wow, I, I think my first reaction to hearing you talk about the role is it, that's a lot of uh, compartmentalizing <laughs> and just, organization and being nimble um uh, it seems like it seems it's strategy it's operations it's marketing it's relationship building it's really everything um for 
maybe the most important population in the community, the youth. So that's a big, big, big job. I'm, I'm curious, kind of with that said, how you got to where you are. So what's the journey look like? Uh, you know, what, what were the other jobs that you held and, and things that you worked on before you became a public information officer? Sure. And this is always fun to, to tell people because it, a lot of the times it, it's, it's almost like a movie. Um, you know, <laughs> when I was, when I was in college, um, at Hanover, um, I, I did play football for a year, but then like, like many, I retired after, after one season, um, and decided to focus my energy elsewhere. And that's kind of where I stumbled on, uh, broadcasting, um, in the communication department and got involved doing some games, um, for the local school channel that they had there, um, doing basketball games, volleyball games, things like that. And they also from time to time would have um, a local radio station on to broadcast basketball and football games. And that's where Larry Duke, for anybody listening that uh, went to Hanover, they know of Larry Duke, he's a, he's a local legend, um, reached out one time and said, hey, have you ever thought about doing anything in radio? And I'm like, yeah, you know, I've, I've enjoyed doing this. Um, you know, I'd love to give it a shot. And so from there, while I was still in school, started working um, for the local radio station there, WIKI or Wiki Country, and uh, started out really just working the board in the studio for NASCAR races. Um, you know, on Saturdays and Sundays, um, I'd go in there, set up, do my homework, um, you know, and every so often I'd hear the cue to, to hit the commercial button and, and would run commercials. And um, so it was a great way to just kind of get involved with the studio work. And eventually um, a guy, my junior year of college, um, who had hosted the Saturday morning show for a long time, uh, decided to retire. And there was an opening to do the Saturday morning show. And so I talked to Larry and said, Hey, this is something that I want to do. I want to give it a shot. You know, it's just Saturday mornings. It's just four hours. You know, we can, we can make this happen. And uh, they gave me a shot. They gave me a shot and said, you know, we want to help you do it and, and make it work for you. And so um, that's really where I kind of had my first real gig in radio um, was doing that. And so I continued to work for them throughout um, the last couple of years of college there um, and, and really got a lot of experience on air um, working in um, NASCAR. You know, we were their closest FM station. Um, to Kentucky Speedway there in Sparta. Uh, we were able to get all the exclusive rights to go and broadcast um, from the track, interview drivers, uh, which was a lot of fun, um, interviewing, you know, these top level drivers. Danica Patrick was, was in NASCAR and IndyCar at the time, got to go do that. Um, Kyle Busch, um, you know, the big names of NASCAR and IndyCar, we got to go and interview and talk to. So that was a great experience for me. Um, I continued to work on football and basketball and a um, little bit of baseball. And uh, we also broadcast the uh, hydroplane boat races um, on the river in the summertime, which was was a really interesting um, experience because I wasn't from Madison. People who were from Madison always talked about the hydroplane races as a kid. And, um, you know, they used to race in Owensboro a long time ago. Uh, but even when I was a kid, but we never went. It just wasn't something mm -hmm. that we ever went to. Um, so getting to do that for the first time, that was my first professional um, kind of real radio interview um, with professional drivers. And so that was a lot of fun. Uh, but once I graduated, I knew that um, I wanted to do some different things, kind of move up to the next level. Um, I had the opportunity to work for um, an arena football team for um, a season. That was an experience in and of itself. We could probably do another uh, whole hour on that as well. Um, but the, that team was based out of Evansville, Indiana. Um, and got to do uh, their play-by-play -play for them on their ESPN station there um, in Evansville. That was my senior year of college. And then from there, got a job um, down in Nashville, Tennessee, working for Lipscomb University. Uh, it's a Division I uh, program down there in Nashville, um, doing their play-by-play uh, -play for their volleyball team was kind of how that started mm -hmm. out. Um, got the opportunity to do that. At the time, they had this thing called ASUN TV, the Atlantic Sun Conference, which is where they were. Um, that was the conference they were in, still are in. Uh, and they had an ASUN TV. So it was just a video stream um, that they had for their conference. Uh, but as the season progressed, towards the end of the year, they started building 
um, their own in-house studio um, in the basketball arena where the volleyball team played. And they became the first um, Atlantic Sun conference team to do um, an ESPN3 broadcast. This is when ESPN3 was just kind of starting to get off the ground. Uh, it's known as Watch ESPN now. Um, and so they were the first ones to do that. I was the first one um, to do that broadcast. And it eventually uh, came down to getting to host the Atlantic Sun Volleyball Championship. Um, Lipscomb was the number one seed they got to host at home and so I got to broadcast that entire tournament um, mm -hmm. which was a lot of fun uh, my voice was gone at the end of it had to uh, uh, you know do some bourbon and lemon and, and honey and try and get the voice back between games but uh, you know it was a lot of fun I really enjoyed that um, at the same time I was also working for Cumulus Radio um, in Nashville as well uh, working for two of their radio stations, uh, 104.5 The Zone, which was the Titans, uh, Tennessee Titans flagship radio station. Got to work with them and do some stuff kind of in promotions and behind the scenes um, and operate the board for one of their Saturday morning shows there. Um, from there, I, I really wanted to get into baseball. I loved what I did um, at Lipscomb. I eventually started doing uh, basketball, um, softball, and some other sports for them, um, working in both TV and radio. And it was a blast. I, I enjoyed it, but I wanted to do baseball full time. That was kind of where I really wanted to be. And so an opportunity came up in the Frontier League um, with a team in Rockford, Illinois. And that's something that uh, I had never been there, never really heard of Rockford up until that point. Um, and there was a, a guy who um, worked for a team in Evansville with the Evansville Otters who really encouraged me to uh, go pursue that. Um, I had interviewed with him for a job and he actually hired somebody else, but we became good friends um, and he encouraged me to take that job. So I did, sight unseen, never been there, um, didn't know anything about the town. And uh, I left Nashville, it was 75 and sunny. I drove to Rockford, <laughs> Illinois, and it was negative 17, and there was two and a half feet of snow on the ground, oh, yeah. uh, all within a 24-hour period. So <laughs> that, that was wild. I uh, had never um, been so cold in my entire life. Um, spent a season there in Rockford um, doing the play-by-play the, uh, -play for them, as well as media relations and advertising, sales, those types of things, because um, that's really how you made money um, when you got to the minor league baseball side of things was doing sales. Um, the agreement that I had was they, they paid, I think it was like $1,200 a month, um, was, was my salary, but I made 20% commission on anything that I sold, um, for advertising sales. So you really kind of had to have that hustle and that drive, um, to get out, talk to people you don't know. Um, you know, you go up to Northern Illinois and you kind of have a, a Kentucky accent. Nobody wants to talk to you. So it was, it was fun <laughs> trying to, to break in up there and try and get those, those sponsorships, but we squeaked by and, and made it through, um, made it through the season there and, and had some great players. Uh, we had, I think six guys from that team. It was an independent league baseball team. So it meant we had to pay the players um, and they, they were, you know, on our contract, but uh, periodically from time to time, major league teams would purchase their contracts and put them in their minor league system. So I think on that particular team, um, we had six guys who made it to um, minor league baseball and then one who um, eventually did make it to the major leagues. Um, his name was Jose wow. Martinez. Uh, he played uh, for Kansas city, um, St. Louis, um, and now he is currently with the New York Mets. Um, so mm -hmm. he's, he's a, he was one of my favorite players um, still there. But we had several guys. Um, oh, no, we did have two on that team. We had two that made it. Uh, a guy named Josh Smoker um, was a relief pitcher, um, and he did make it to the show uh, pitching for Los Angeles and I believe the, the Pirates um, as mm. well. So, so we had two guys that made it, uh, which was really rare. Um, we had a really solid team. That was a lot of fun. Um, mm -hmm. and from there, that following season, um, they made an ownership change and made some changes. And so I found myself looking for um, a different baseball job right in the middle of the season uh, and wanted to, uh, didn't know where I was going to go. And I, I was fortunate that a job opened up in Lynchburg, Virginia, um, it, which uh, is in the western part of the state of Virginia and went down there, uh, was able to be the number two broadcaster for that team who happened to be the uh, high A affiliate 
of the Cleveland Indians. And there's, for those that are watching on video, there's my nameplate that um, came with it. So it had the Hillcats logo on one side and the Indians logo on the other. Um, and that was an absolute blast. The people there um, were so much fun. Um, you know, there were several guys on that team that have since made it to um, the show. J.P. Fire Eisen, um, who was my roommate at the time, uh, he now plays for the Tampa Bay Rays. Clint Frazier plays for the New York Yankees. Bradley Zimmer plays for the Indians. Um, so at least those guys, there's been several others um, that were on that team um, have made it to the show. So it's fun to still watch those guys play um, and do their thing. But, you know, if you thought the pay was low in Rockford, uh, this was a, a whole nother <laughs> level of low. Uh, I was working for $750 a month. Uh, living with a host family uh, who I did not know. I moved down there and they just happened to be boosters for the, for the team and uh, hosted players from time to time. And they agreed to host uh, a broadcaster. Um, so that was a lot of fun going there, but that was a great experience um, with that team uh, traveling. Um, the hotels were a lot nicer than they were in independent league ball. Um, you still traveled by bus everywhere you went, but the stadiums were a lot nicer. Um, the people were uh, really cool. And you got to see some of those big names um, that you see playing, you know, in college baseball and now playing in the show, um, which yeah. was a lot of fun. So that was a, uh, a one season deal as well. Um, they offered me the shot to come back, um, but I would still be in the same position. I would have been the number two guy. Um, and I was about to turn 26, needed some insurance. And so um, I moved back to Louisville, Kentucky um, to live with a buddy of mine and uh, ended up getting a job at a PR firm um, in Louisville. It was called Tandem Public Relations. Mm -hmm. And that was something that um, I really didn't have any experience in, didn't really know what to expect. Um, I knew that a lot of the work that I had done in media relations, um, you know, from doing TV interviews and interviewing players and setting those up and knowing how the media works, I knew that that would help. Uh, but I really didn't know what to expect um, in terms of, of what a PR firm was going to be. Uh, but mm -hmm. that it was a lot of fun. The clients that they had were, um, you know, the KFC, Young Brands, um, they worked with them, the Kentucky Center for the Arts, uh, the Louisville Slugger Museum, which, of course, coming out of baseball was the one that I was really excited about. Um, mm -hmm. They also worked with a number of nonprofits. Um, you know, that was really kind of the bread and butter was working with nonprofits to kind of help um, drive their mission and drive, um, you know, their their traffic with their with their people that they were trying to reach. And so I really learned a lot in that job, especially working in a much bigger market than I'd ever been in. Um, you know, when you when you are flooded as a news station, when you are flooded with so many things um, in a large market to only fill a 30 minute time slot um, for the evening news, you really have to find a way to grab their attention. Why is what you are trying to promote what needs to be on the evening news. And so we dealt with a lot of really wild stuff. Um, you know, the fun stuff we were promoting, you know, Louisville Slugger doing, doing different events and hosting, um, you know, big time people from major league and minor league baseball and, and those types of things. But then we also were dealing with some crisis situations. Um, one of the other clients was the U of L foundation. So we were representing U of L in the middle of all of their scandals um, with the dorm rooms and the basketball teams and the president being fired and those types mm -hmm. of things. Um, so we were right in the middle of all of that. Um, one of the clients was a shopping center um, there in Louisville and they had a, a teenager who uh, was with his girlfriend and wrecked his car um, there near the near the shopping center they had both ended up passing away and so then the family was like showing up and have and wanting to like make this like their own morning site and types of things so we were dealing with all kinds of different crisis situations um, and so that job really prepared me for being able to handle anything um, that kind of came my way um, with this job uh, in in schools so when I came in for uh, this interview uh, for this job you know they said you know tell us about you know a crisis that you've had to deal with or whatever I said well how much how much time do you got we, we dealt with quite a few. Um, and so, you know, this position opened up, I was looking, uh, I wasn't necessarily looking to leave Louisville. Um, I was looking to kind of do something a little different. Um, it wasn't the, the PR life was, was great, but it wasn't exactly kind of what I thought it was going to be. And so I, I really uh, didn't know what was going to be next. Um, and so 
um, somebody sent this job to me um, and I looked it over and it was like right in my wheelhouse. You know, you're dealing with, mm -hmm. with media relations, you're, you're helping share the stories of, of the things that are happening in the school district. Um, and my biggest thing was, do I really want to move back home? Because, uh, you know, when I left to go off to college, I said, I'm never coming back. This town is nothing to do here. I'm never coming back. Um, but I did come back to visit and uh, see my sister was living here at the time, still does. And I came back to visit her and we went out. Uh, we had the barbecue festival, which is a big thing that we've had here for years. Um, went downtown and saw how much the city had grown um, over the past 10 years um, and really decided that, you know, maybe this is a place that, that I could come and, and be happy. And so um, I've been here. It'd be, it's right at about three and a half years now. Um, been here. So um, things have been going great. Of course, you know, we had to deal with the pandemic last year, uh, but but uh, coming to this job and, and meeting with uh, the folks who hired me, you know, it's funny in the interview. I was sitting there, my mom was a teacher um, here in Davis County for a long time. She taught for the county school district. Um, and my dad worked for both of the school districts here in town. And the people who were in the room interviewing me, I knew every single one of them. Um, right. the, the superintendent at the time taught with my mom. Uh, his chief academic officer was my high school principal um, at a different school district. So I knew all of these people. Um, and so it really made the transition really smooth because it felt like, you know, I'd known these people for so long um, and they knew me and it was just a natural fit to, to move right in. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, thanks for sharing that. I think it makes a lot of sense as I listen to you walk through the journey. It makes a lot of sense why you are you know, uniquely qualified to be doing what you're doing now. It, it all like, it all comes together. Um, we, we talked about this a little bit before we started, but you know, the last, let's call it 18 months, but certainly longer um, PR and in particular, you know, public information for school systems, for um, local governments, for example, it has kind of been maybe the most important act, let's call it activity system in our in our society without realizing it. I know you did. Um, and so if someone you know thinks about that, they think about what you've just walked through and they say, hey, I'd like to you know explore public relations, whether it's in your sector or in an agency, as a career path, you know, what advice would you give them? What, what do they need to know? Um, what are their options? Where do they begin? Sure. So the, the, the funny part about it is, is there are now so many different positions where uh, this particular skill set can be useful. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be specific to schools. Uh, it doesn't have to be specific to a, a, a PR firm type of deal. Um, it could be working for a specific organization and simply just push, pushing out, um, you know, and promoting the things that, that they are doing, whether it be a hospital or, um, you know, a big insurance company or any, anything like that. So um, there's really a lot uh, that kind of just goes into it. Um, you know, having a good relationship with the media, knowing how to, how they operate, um, you know, knowing that their production meetings are in the morning and mm -hmm. that the, the more work that you can do for them um, to make their job easier, the more likely you are to get media coverage. So, you know, with every press release that I type out, um, if I know that it's going to print media, I always include a headshot um, because they always, if, especially if it's about like a new hire or something like that, I always include a headshot because they're going to want that. Um, you know, newspaper is always going to want um, a photo of some kind. So if you're promoting like a, um, you know, a bike rally for, uh, you know, bikes, bicycle safety, uh, you know, they're going to want to come by and get a picture of kids riding their bike. So you have to be able to tell people, hey, you know, they're coming, be ready to be on camera, that type of thing. Um, when it comes to TV, um, you know, the more, you, you can also frame it the other direction of uh, making it easier on your superintendent. So like today, for example, um, you know, when we announced that um, we were going to be returning to full in-person learning uh, at the start of this school year, we did so in conjunction with the county school district and the Catholic school district here um, in our community, which is, is rare to get those three entities um, in any community together to work a, as one. And so when we, when we put out the press release, um, I told the news people, I said, hey, 
I can only get the superintendents together for 30 minutes. This is when they're going to be here. If you want your sound bites and want their interviews, you all need to come at once. And so, you know, I, I made it out as, yeah, I'm making it easier on the TV. But what it really did was free those superintendents up for the rest of the day. So they're not stuck dealing with phone calls and interviews and, and all of that type of stuff um, throughout the rest of the day. Um, you know, you really kind of have to know your target audience. I, I think one of the biggest things um, from a strategy standpoint um, that I've really kind of developed and, and built over the years, especially over this past year, is when you get done writing something or getting ready to pitch something to the media or push something out on Facebook or, or Twitter or whatever, is to really stop and take a look at it and then put yourself in the shoes of those on both sides of the decision. So for example, yeah. um, with the mask wearing, you know, for reopening with school, and that's just the one that's fresh on my mind, but it, it, it applies to anything you push out really. Um, you know, if you say we are going to require masks on the bus, but we're not going to require them in the school building, um, you know, because that's what the guidance says or whatever, you know, then you have to sit there and think, okay, people on this side are going to go, well, how does that make sense? Why, why do you have to, um, you know, why does wearing them on the bus make sense when making, you know, when they're not going to wear them in the classroom? So then you have to start answering in your head, coming up with answers to those questions to prepare the superintendent or even myself, if I'm the one that's on camera of how I'm going to defend those questions. Um, right. You know, say we go the other direction of, you know, or, or keep the same, keep the same deal. Mask can be required on the bus. Okay. So somebody is like, this is great news. You know, I really wish they were going to keep them in the classroom, but you know, why is it only on the bus and not in the classroom? And then doing the same type of deal there. Um, I think the other, and so really being able to play both sides in your head. Um, it's like having an inner debate with yourself, you know, mm -hmm. putting two people on, on either side um, and figuring out how you're going to, what questions they're going to ask and how you're going to answer them. I think uh, that's probably one of the biggest things that you can do um, from PR and really any communication. Um, even if you're sending, um, you know, if you're a, a manager of a business or a company um, and you're going to send out an all staff email, same type of deal. You type up your email and before you send it out, what are the questions that your staff are going to ask and how are you going to, how can you defend those? And if you, if you want to get ahead of it, add that into your email, you know, add those things that they're going to ask. You may ask about X, Y, and Z. Here's why we're doing it, you know, whatever, and go ahead and answer it to try and minimize um, those types of questions. And then I think really the last thing, um, the last big thing that I would say um, for somebody who wants to work in a situation where you are the spokesperson for your, your school district or your company, or you're the person who's going to be on, on camera all the time, what, even if you're not the, um, the owner of the company or whatever, is you have to be able to put aside your personal thoughts on things or your personal views on things um, and go with the direction that um, you know, your company or your supervisor or your superintendent, whoever that may be, wants to go. Um, now, that doesn't mean that when you're in the planning meetings to, to shy away and to not, you know, say this is what's going on. And I think that's one of the best things about um, this district that I work for is our superintendent says, yes, please challenge me, ask me these questions, um, because I need to be prepared for. Them. And so, mm -hmm. you know, with the information that we sent out um, today, there were several conversations that weren't always the easiest conversations. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I told him, I said, look, this is, this is what I think. This is what I would do strategically. But if you decide to do something else, that's what we'll do. And, and we'll work through it. So you really just have to kind of push aside, um, you know, your personal views, especially with something that's been so politically charged as, as COVID has, um, mm -hmm. and just kind of do, um, do what's best, um, for the company and for the people that you serve, which in our case is students. Yeah, it's fascinating. Just thinking about all the uh, m the recent events. And when I say recent, I do mean like the last year and a half to two years. Uh, and then looking at that through your lens, for example. Uh, never would have thought about it until we met. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. It's one of those things that like, you know, no matter, well, at least, at least during COVID, it didn't matter what decision you made. 
it was never going to be unanimous. <laughs> people were going to be for or against. I mean, it just, it wasn't going to happen. Yeah. Uh, and, and luckily, you know, we, we were very fortunate to um, have a good group of, of kind of regional PIOs, like people in my position, um, to bounce ideas off each other. We were constantly sharing drafts of our communications with each other um, and really just kind of trying to just push through. And we, we leaned a lot on, um, you know, during the last school year of, the guidance and and what and a lot of the decisions that were being made were oh well it's mandated by the governor or the department of education or whoever that may be um mm -hmm. and so that took a little bit of the heat off us but still people were you know under the impression if well you can do something different it's like well no we can't because <laughs> you know if we if we do something different then the health department could legally step in and shut the school down and that's not what we wanted to happen so um, so last year was very tough, but it was it was fun to, to kind of work through that. Um, certainly, we all gained a lot of experience um, in, in how to handle some things moving forward. But uh, it was definitely more I saw it personally as more of an opportunity um, to kind of be on the forefront of how people handled these types of things. Um, and, and from a communication standpoint, from an interacting with um, our students and families, getting information out to them. Uh, kind of standpoint than it was more of just a burden. So, um, and I think a lot of people kind of looked at it that way too. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. Jared, we're, we're nearing the end here, but the last thing I like to ask everyone is this, it, it, what is the kindest thing someone's done for you at work? So um, it could be, you know, someone offering you an opportunity, someone you, someone making an introduction, Anything like that, you know, work related? Yeah, you know, that's a tough one um, because I have been so fortunate to meet so many incredible people um, along the way. I mean, you know, I mentioned the legend Larry Duke himself um, <laughs> you know, really giving me that first shot um, to kind of launch this career. Um, you know, he was he really was the guy that gave me my start, um, you know, and so he was great. Um, there was a guy in Lynchburg um, whose name was Ronnie Roberts. Um, and he recently passed away um, last year from, from a long battle with cancer, but the guy had the biggest personality um, of anybody ever. And he was just a true Southern gentleman um, and, and took a, took a, uh, a chance on the guy that he did not know um, from Rockford, Illinois to come work down um, with his baseball team, um, you know, in the middle of a season, um, which could have changed up a whole dynamic uh, of different things. So he was a, he was a great mentor um, and a great friend, but really, you know, I, I, it's hard to just say one, one person or one thing, um, you know, it's been the kindest thing. Um, it's really tough, but you know, all those people that have taken a chance on me along the way to just give me an opportunity. Um, Cause it's really all I ever said I wanted. It was just an opportunity to, to show you that I could do it. Um, and if I couldn't, then, you know, we went our separate ways, but um, there were a lot of people that took a chance on me, including Larry and Ronnie and um, a number of other people um, that I'm truly grateful for um, to, to be where I'm at today. I love that. Thanks for sharing it. I, I think, uh, I think all the people who have given you chances are probably pretty happy about that decision. I think it's, it's panning out and I, I suspect that you'll do the same for other folks coming up. So uh, Jared, thanks so much for your time. I know you are incredibly busy doing important work. It's really exciting to me. Like I was excited that we had to reschedule. I'm like, well, what's he doing? Um, yeah. But yeah, in all seriousness, thanks. Thanks so much for what you do and especially for your time in this podcast. Well, I appreciate you having me on. I mean, it's always fun to talk about what I do and and try and get people more interested um, in this type of profession. Because I mean, like I said, public information officer type position for school districts across the state and across the country um, is really growing. I just got back from a conference uh, of the National School Public Relations Association, um, and there were more than a thousand people down there at that conference. And so it's truly mm -hmm. Um, a growing industry across the across the country, not just here in Kentucky. Um, and so it's a lot of fun. And, and I really hope people uh, get the chance to take a look at it and maybe consider it. Absolutely. Hey, thanks again, Jared. Have a great weekend. Um, look forward to talking to you again soon. Yeah, thanks, Jimmy. Anytime. All right. See you, Jared. See you.